which is a long time ago. Uh, David Hilbert. Uh, who was the leading mathematician of the age, Hilbert and Poincaré dominated uh, mathematics in the beginning of the 20th century. And Hilbert uh, was giving an address at the International Congress of Mathematicians in uh, Paris. And he listed, he gave in this address, which you can get on the web, translated into any language you want, probably Korean. Certainly, the address was in, he gave the lecture in Paris, but the lecture was in German, but you can get an English translation, certainly on the web, and maybe a Korean translation as well. And he listed 20 problems for the 20th century. So, the number 20 was the relevant uh, issue. 20 problems for the 20th century for, that he suggested people to work on now. It's, uh, of course, uh, anybody can list problems, but Hilbert being the leading mathematician of the age, when it's uh, somebody of Hilbert's uh, uh, standing in the mathematics world gives a lecture suggesting 20 problems, then these 20 problems had the, uh, became uh, uh, significant and people uh, worked on them. And some were solved and some were proven not to have a solution. And it's in fact a uh, book, there's more than one book, but there's a, a book on Hilbert's problems and you can pr maybe get it on the web. Of course you can find the list of the problems many places. But anyways, uh, but one of the problems was the sixth problem. Okay. okay. And the sixth problem roughly was uh, the, called the axiomatization. I think that was the axiomatization. of mechanics. That was the theme. So, could mechanics, mechanics as Hilbert knew it, uh, be put on the same level as the other fields that deal in pure axiomatics, which is arithmetic, okay, and geometry. Could they put on the same level uh, with a list of axioms, just like we when we study geometry in high school. You give me the axioms of Euclidean geometry and then everything else follows and would it work? Okay, and this was uh, Hilbert's uh, program and it, within the context of that uh, axiomatization he posed the following problem. If we can give as an axiom something A can we derive B from A? If A is more fundamental, then we should be able to derive B. Okay, so within the realm of uh, continuum mechanics, if we knew the mechanics of Hilbert's uh, day, we had Newtonian mechanics, because it preceded the relativity, so we had Newtonian mechanics. Okay. Then we had statistical mechanics, which was a new field at the time. And then we had continuum mechanics. Now, of course, uh, uh, there was uh, the issue of can you get a smaller scale than the uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics? And the answer, well, the answer turned out to be yes, of course. There were smaller scales, but that was uh, after Hilbert. So quantum mechanics didn't enter the picture until uh, into the 1920s. Uh, so 
Hilbert couldn't have known about quantum mechanics. Uh, it was just the, at its infancy at best. So, but uh, Hilbert had going the issues of Newtonian mechanics. So, we could start with Newtonian mechanics is just, we can imagine, gas dynamics is the simplest. So we can imagine that particles of gas collide in the room. So we have molecules and they would uh, move in the room as m Newtonian mechanics. And then can we go from Newtonian mechanics to statistical mechanics? And can we go from statistical mechanics to continuum mechanics? That is the, this would be ODEs. This is sort of PDEs with integrals and this is pure PDEs. And why are we interested, of course, practically, uh, though Hilbert was interested in mathematics, if you want to know the temperature in the room, or how the gas moves in the room, we do not use Newtonian mechanics or statistical mechanics. If we want to predict the weather for tomorrow, based on today's weather, this is an undoable computation. And this is almost an undoable computation, but since we watch the newspaper or the TV or the web, somebody's doing some sort of prediction and it's based on continuum mechanics. So it's very practical. Also, as I say, if you fly in an airplane, okay, the airplane is not built based on Newtonian mechanics or statistical mechanics, at least the design. It's based on continuum mechanics. So that's the idea So it's from a practical point of view. So this was the issue. So you could ask, well, can you go from here to there, or can you go from there to there? So the one facet of Hilbert's question that he mentioned explicitly as can we go from statistical mechanics, which is a fairly new field at the time, to continuum mechanics. So the statistical mechanics had been developed originally for equilibrium configurations. So the equilibrium state of, say, the gas in the room was developed by Maxwell. Maxwell was, a, of course, maybe the greatest physicist of the 19th century and developed uh, many great results, of course, Maxwell's equations being one of them, electromagnetic theory, but he also developed equilibrium stati statistical mechanics. So there was Maxwell and of course simultaneously with Maxwell was Gibbs in the United States. Okay. So Maxwell developed equilibrium statistical mechanics, which was based on a new way of uh, thinking that we didn't think about what the uh, actual particle location was. That would be Newtonian mechanics. It was to introduce the concept of statistics into the story, saying, oh, I don't really care what the individual particle, I can't even think about that. But what's the probability of finding a particle at this position, at this, uh, moving with this such a speed at such a time? So it introduced the notion of probability into science. Which is a whole new way of thinking. So the, changed the history of science forever because it introduced the notion of uh, probability into the mechanical way of thinking. And of course, once that was done, later in the 20th century, it was realized that the uh, same idea could be used in quantum mechanics when uh, we st still worry about the probability of finding particles or the quanta at a certain position, and that is uh, Schrodinger's equation. So you see, science was... Uh, revolutionized by this uh, view. 
So then, as I said, so let's get back to Hilbert's address. So he, one of the questions he asked is, can you make, go from this way? Okay, and of course, why, what's the point among other things? Not only, of course, was uh, Hilbert proposing that this uh, axiomatically we could go from here to there to there, just as we, as I said, in geometry or arithmetic, but it also says, can we, is, is there a fundamental uh, theory of science and a unified theory? So people are working on a unified theory forever now. Once they realized the general relativity was, can you unite all s subjects at all scales? So general relativity is really big scales, and quantum mechanics is really small scales. And the idea is, can you put them together? Of course, general relativity is down here, even the biggest scales. So this is the theory of gravity. And the question is, can you go from uh, all these scales? And so far, nobody knows. Okay. Uh, so, of course, it's popular in the physics departments to look at string theory as a possible unification. So, is there a unification between statistical mechanics and continuum mechanics? And Hilbert made it a legitimate problem to work on. He made it legal. Okay, I'm a mathematician. Hilbert said it's a good problem. That means I can work on it and still get paid. Okay, it's legal. So he made it a legal problem. And of course, uh, once these problems become legalized, uh, then mathematicians start to work on them. And it's been a subject of uh, historical interest ever since. Okay, so the question is, can we go from statistical mechanics to continuum mechanics? The, as I said, the equilibrium theory was worked out by Maxwell, but the dynamic theory, making the particles move, okay, and the is, was worked out by uh, Boltzmann. Okay. In the, I guess about 1875 or so, 1880. So Boltzmann uh, was in Austria, he worked out this uh, theory. Okay. It had many detractors. He was attacked. He became depressed. And then sadly, Boltzmann committed suicide. A little warning that science is always not treating its uh, greatest people so kindly. Uh, he was not, uh, he, it was not greeted with great warmth by the physics community and it took a long uh, time before it was uh, accepted. Okay, so, so the question is, could we go from the Boltzmann equation, so at the level here, Hilbert's program became, as he wrote exactly, or said exactly in his lecture, can, could he go from the Boltzmann equation, the equations of statistical mechanics, say for the gas in the room, to the continuum mechanics, would be the classical equations of Euler for the motion of gas in the room. And, uh, okay, it's a famous problem. Many papers discussing it. And uh, so, is it true? Was Hilbert right or Hilbert wrong? And the theme of the question is, uh, can you do this? And of course, if anybody could uh, succeed positively, it would be guaranteed, of course, a Fields Medal. A Nobel Prize, I don't know, because it's theory. But Fields Medal, uh, guaranteed if you're young enough. And uh, uh, Pierre-Louis Lyons and Ron DePerno in fact, I think this was one of their goals when they uh, did their work on the Boltzmann equation, was that if they game, came up with the right techniques, then they could, uh, in fact, prove Hilbert was correct, that uh, you, can, you could go from Boltzmann to Euler, hence solving the conservation laws of gas dynamics. And since there is no 
proof of the existence of solutions to the conservation laws of gas dynamics, you would have found, number one, a new proof, which would be fantastic, and number two, shown that Hilbert's program could be carried through, and hence a unification of statistical mechanics with continuum mechanics. So it would be a major contribution. Now, the Perna and Leones in their paper, of course, did not go from here to here, but Leon still got a Fields Medal. It's not bad. Okay. And he was here in Korea just a few weeks ago. He was here at KAIST, I, I guess, so he was here at KAIST, the other way. Okay. And, but they did come up with a resolution in some sort of, the, at least the initial value problem for the Boltzmann equation. Okay. And not only did one Fields Medal go, but uh, then Cedric Villani at the last uh, International Congress for his work again on the Boltzmann equation also got a Fields Medal. Okay. So not bad. So then uh, we, we're left with this uh, question and then the question is, okay, is it true or isn't it? Can we go from Boltzmann to Euler? So can we do it? And so far, so let's, uh, so here's the quick uh, advertisement of these lectures before I start. So there should be no surprises, no sense waiting for the surprise. So the advertisement, so can we go? So, so far, the only results in the positive direction are comparatively easy to get, which says that if you're on a time, we know for the Euler equations, this is smooth solution locally in time. Okay, it doesn't make any difference what the Euler, we know for differential equations, usually if it even, if the differential equation as an initial value makes sense at all, initial value problem makes sense at all, we should be able to prove local existence. Whether it's ODEs, PDEs, if you can't even prove local existence, it means the equations really were poorly formulated. For ODEs, of course, we have the uh, usual Piano theorem or the Picard theorem. For PDEs, we teach the courses, oh, we teach Cauchy Kowalewski, it's a terrible proof, but we teach it or we teach contraction mappings. So usually something works local in time. So the results, easy results say more or less for the Euler equations, if these equations, the one you're trying to derive, have smooth solutions up till some time, then you can go from here to here. But if you think about that, that's usually pretty easy to prove. Okay, all it means is that this guy somehow has to be consistent with that guy because then nothing goes wrong. The harder thing, okay, is when this one doesn't have smooth solutions. Okay, then what happens? Okay, and what happens in the gas dynamics is shock waves could form. Okay, so the question is, okay, can we go from Boltzmann, I'll write from here, from Boltzmann to Euler, that's the question. And the answer is, well, if, we have, if E has smooth solutions, okay, on some interval zero to capital T, okay, on time, okay, then the answer is yes, and there are a variety of uh, proofs, and it's, uh, you can find it in the book of uh, Law St. Ramon, who's a mathematician, she's in Paris, okay. So the answer is yes, up for smooth solutions. But those proofs, as I said, no insult, but sort of obvious, okay. But that doesn't answer the question because, okay, the goal would be to produce solutions to the Euler equations after the smooth solutions stop existing because if I just wanted to prove existence to Euler equations, I, it's, it becomes a circular argument. Okay, I'm trying to prove Euler has a solution, some solutions, 
And I'm assuming they have solutions to get here, so it's circular. The question is, can you, what can you do after Euler, uh, the smooth solutions break down because of uh, discontinuities forming? So how about after smooth solutions? So how about for T greater than this uh, breakdown time? Okay. And then, so far, no results. Okay. So, Hilbert's, uh, this fa part of Hilbert's sixth problem remains unresolved up to this moment, which is 10 to 11 on uh, today. So as of today, as at this time, I know of no results. But I can give you my guess, and that's what the lectures are about. So I can give you my guess. So it's per purely personal, and I'll, of course, the guess, uh, any guess you could say yes or no, but you have to have a guess with a reason. Okay, just a guess, we could flip a coin. Okay, but a guess with a reason, a logical reason, then it's a little more interesting. So my guess, and the answer is no. So I, it's my belief based on the elementary computations, which we'll do, okay, is that the answer is no. Uh, Hilbert was wrong. But of course we shouldn't blame Hilbert. Okay. First of all, Hilbert didn't know about weak solutions. He, he wasn't thinking, it was just a couple of sentences. Was he worried about all the possible difficulties that we would learn about in the years after 1900, wherever I wrote? So of course he wasn't a, he was a smart guy, but he wasn't a prophet. He, he couldn't possibly know how mathematics would develop in uh, all the years after his time. Uh, so he didn't, uh, 1900, he lived until I think 1944. So he still lived for another 44 years. But my guess is, okay, so first of all, he wasn't thinking about shock waves and all the possible things that could go wrong. So it was a reasonable guess. But my reason, his was a reasonable guess, and my guess is, okay, he, it was a, a nice idea, it motivated a lot of uh, mathematics, but I think that it won't work. And uh, so that's what I'll, and I'll explain why, so the details are not very complicated, but it takes a little time. So let me erase now, and then we'll, the next thing is to write down uh, Boltzmann's equation and see the formal relationship between the, these two. So it requires no, uh, no knowledge of Boltzmann. I have a question. Yeah. So if you, the answer is no, then, 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 how, can the, then how it should think about the Boltzmann equation? Is it just give it just for the two something? Exactly, exactly. So there isn't the... Uh, so my guess is there is not a unification of scales. So at least after in the shock wave. That is the shock wave okay, is so thin okay, that you can, you've lost the, uh, you're already lost the separation of scales because the shock wave itself is at the thin scale anyways. So, so that this, uh, I would, could use fancy colors, but let's say, uh, so my guess is the arrow isn't true, at least when you have shock waves okay, for weak solutions. And there was a th two theories. Okay. If you're at very small scales, okay, and you want to know how the uh, gas moves, okay, which is very important, I can give the, certainly, as I say, in nuclear engineering, they do this every day. In fact, they not only use the Boltzmann, they use the linearized Boltzmann equation. They need to know how neutrons are transported. So transport at the small scales is very important. Exactly how neutrons is. You want to build a uh, nuclear reactor. And if you want to build a nuclear reactor, I suggest do not build it here. Build it near somebody else's house. Okay. But if you build a nuclear reactor, okay, or even in uh, medical imaging, okay? So we need to know transport. 
And then it's a perfectly good theory at small scales. On the other hand, if we have very large scales, okay, then this continuum mechanics. Okay. So the two theories, but the being able to rigorously pass between them, maybe not. So this just as it may end up, who knows, that we can't go from the ability to unify things at, from small scales to big scales. Okay. This, is, for us, of course, is a big problem. But for the physicists, this is a huge problem. If you count the number of people working on this thing, in the world, how many mathematicians are there? A well, few. But these days, okay, because of string theory, there's at least a thousand people trying to do this one and still they don't succeed. So. But the idea is always trying to do unification. It's always difficult and always a challenge, but very practical. Because, uh, and the worst of course, is you're doing a numerical computation and you have to resolve things at both two scales. Say, I want to know what's happening in the room, but then I want to get close to the wall, the very small scales, and then the numerical analyst has to be able to be able to go from one to the other. And that's very difficult. Okay, so my answer, my guess is no, and I'll try to explain the reasons. So now I'll, let's go back and start with Boltzmann, since it makes the question only makes sense if I write down the mathematics and the Boltzmann. So let's erase here. And By the way, nobody should waste any time taking notes. As you know, everything is on the web someplace. I wrote out the notes, so. So let's write the Boltzmann equation. And so I'll use, let's write, I think, the del x or grad x, I don't know, either way. Okay, so that's the Boltzmann equation. So I have to tell you what all the letters mean. That's a dot. Okay, so first of all, I don't bother because I'm too lazy to tell you who's a vector and who's a scalar. So let's agree, and then I hope so. So first of all, x is a vector and it's a point in three-dimensional space. Okay. Psi is a vector, and it's also in three-dimensional space, and T is the time, so it's just a scalar. And as you can see, the equation formally is reversible. I could, there's no, uh, so T is a real number, but we can think, okay, it's going to be positive for initial value problem. Okay, so, and F is a scalar. And it depends on all th these things, so we have psi, x, and t. So what does it say? So what does psi f mean? So f is, can I write it here? It's the problem, this is the genius of Maxwell and Boltzmann, is to introduce probability into the story. So it's the probability of finding a molecule, you can think a particle, a molecule of gas, molecule of gas at point x at time t, moving with velocity Psi. So that's what it means. So it depends on, you have the particle of gas, there it is, point x, time t, but it's moving. So it's moving with velocity psi. Now, this part is called the transport part. Okay. 
and this is the collision part. Okay, so what's Q of F? And the point is, this is the first point, is Q of F is complicated. Okay, it's in the box, but the point is that I try to raise is from the point of view asking this question of uh, going from Boltzmann to Euler, the Q is irrelevant. Just some properties of Q are crucial, which is very nice because this result doesn't mean, okay, I'm working along and there's some Q is an integral operator, it has a kernel, and it says, oh yeah, if I really understood the kernel better, I would get a better result. And I said, doesn't make any difference. It's robust. Okay. Okay. All that technical stuff of functional analysis and blah, blah, blah won't help you. It's, the problem is much more fundamental than that. So the choice, the actual nature of the Q is irrelevant. It just has to have certain properties. Okay, so I'll get to the properties in a second, but first let's note what happens if Q was equal to zero? Well, it isn't, but if QF was identically equal to zero, then just for make, make sure, so there would be no collisions and there would be pure transport. And if you look at that, then the equation would be I'll write a shorthand this way. Okay. And then the solution would be x minus psi t. So f would be of the form some function of x minus psi t. Any function of x minus psi t would work. Just a chain rule. So it just thinks that's why it's just pure, it would just be translation, the particles starting here would move with velocity psi, and they just keep moving along. Okay, nothing to it. On the other hand, if the transport was, and we just had the homogeneous Boltzmann, so no space dependence, that is, we look for a solution, f of psi and t with no x dependence, okay, if f is independent of x, then this term goes away, and we would just get this one, which is the homogeneous Boltzmann equation. Okay, and then we would just see a, a little messy integral differential equation, but no x dependence. And Villani did a lot of, uh, he really became an expert and uh, worked at all the uh, details of this non-homogeneous Boltzmann equation, the homogeneous Boltzmann equation, okay? And he gets great results. So when I wrote the answer, my guess is no to uh, Hilbert's question, and Villani gets great results here, it must mean that the non-homogeneity, the dependence on X, must play a major role. And of course it does. So this one is too easy and this one is too easy. But, but this is the one in real life. Okay. So if you're trying to learn about going from particles or Boltzmann to continuum, this isn't a good example. It's, okay? Good way to write, uh, of course, many interesting mathematical theorems, and you can learn a lot. But you will not learn about going from uh, Boltzmann to Hilbert, Bill uh, Boltzmann to uh, Euler. Okay, so let's do that. Now, as I said, it's my uh, theme here that you don't have to know all the details of the QFF. If you open up a book on uh, Boltzmann equations, say Church and Yanni's book, the best book is by Carl Jung, 
Paolo Cicciniani wrote several books, but uh, the, he has one just entitled The Boltzmann Equation, which is a classic book. I have it on my desk if you want to see it. And uh, so Cicciniani's book will give you, let's see what, see. Book uh, will give you all the details of Q of F, and I, but as I just said, the Q of F, okay, all we need is some special properties. Okay, so what are the properties? So there's two special groups of properties. One is the equilibria, and the other one is the uh, collisional invariance. So first let's do one collisional invariance. That's a fancy word, and it just says some integrals vanish. Okay, so the collisional invariance just says if I take Q and integrate it, remember it's a function of F depends on psi, x, and t, but the computation that I'm going to do only is integrating over the velocities. So this xt stuff is irrelevant because it's only the dependence of over xi and it says, okay, this is a certain function phi of xi so that when you integrate q against phi you always get zero. So what does phi look like? So it can't be any phi, otherwise the answer would be zero. So what does phi look like? And the answer says, it looks of, of the form a scalar a plus a vector b dotted with psi plus, I think I used the letter c, Psi squared. So phi is a scalar valued guy. So A is a scalar. B is an R3. And C is scalar. But if you think about that, and this is going to be true for all A, B, C. C is an R, and it's for all A, B, C. Well, if you think about it, now what does that say? That's one way to think about it. So let's say, let's just go through it. So if it's true for all B and A, B, C, what happens if I choose B and C to be zero? That says it's true for all numbers A. But factor out the A and divide by A, that says it's true for the number one. So one way to see it is it's true for the number one. Okay. And then you just take okay. vice versa. How about if A and C are zero? Then it's true for all B. Okay, that means B is a vector. I can choose first component equal to B1 or one, second and second two equal to zero. Second component equal to one, first and second equal to zero, etc. So that says, oh. It's true for all, say B1 equal, first component equals one, the, the other two are zero, just get psi one, first component of the vector psi. So it's true for the first component, it's true for the second component, it's true for the third component. Okay, last but not least, I put my hand over, said A and B equal to zero, then it's true for all scalars C, again, to take the C outside, divide by C, and it's true for the magnitude of the vector psi squared. So another way to write it, and it's, is to just say, oh, 
it's true. For just these guys, but once you have those guys, okay, it's true for all linear combinations because it's a homogeneous equation. So it just means the collisional invariance are linear combinations of number one, the vector psi, and the magnitude of psi squared. So that's the collisional invariance. Okay, that's number one, and then I'll move over here. So there's only two properties I need. And the property number two is equilibrium. What happens if the, no collisions? Q of F is identically equal to zero. So that's a, an equation. And if I told you what Q is, then I would tell you the solution to the equation. But this saves a lot of time if I just tell you what the solution equation is. So the solution to the equation QF equals zero means okay, that F has to have the form okay, exponential okay, and I think the letters again I use the A, B, C looks familiar, doesn't it? So if a solution QF equals zero means F had to form, have the form of an exponential A dot B dot Xi plus C plus C Xi squared equals zero, A, B, and C are c constants. Okay. But of course this was result was known to Maxwell because Maxwell was dealing with the equilibrium. So how do we, uh, we can rewrite this for convenience. Yeah. Do you mean that the time derivative of Q is zero? Do I mean that? Do you mean that the time derivative of Q is zero? The time derivative. No, I just mean, if I, just solving the algebraic equation independent of the original equation, what does it mean for Q of F equal to zero? Q of F is a function, some integrals over Xi. So, it, there is no time in the equation Q of F equals zero. Does that make sense? You understand? It's just as you're saying, you're talking about uh, the properties of the uh, collision, collision, collision operator. And the Q of F equals zero, then it means F should be Yeah, zero. yeah. If, if, if it was time dependent and, and space dependent, then the A, B, and C would depend on X and T. But the dependence through Xi only is via this combination of Xi and Xi squared and the constant. So if it was time dependent, then the solution of Q of F equals zero would be that. Okay, well, well that's what we'll find out. Yeah. Okay. But first let's just rewrite it to make it look uh, familiar. Okay. So let's say C equal to minus alpha. Why do I make it an alpha is positive? Why that? Because if C equals minus alpha, negative number, then this is in, the function is in L1 in Xi. So I want to force that the tail should go to zero at Xi going to infinity, otherwise it won't make sense for large Xi. So I want to make it uh, the integral. So, and then I can re-choose uh, B equal to, uh, I think, two uh, alpha v, v. Let's see, make sure. I think I, I'm pretty sure it's two alpha V. Let's make sure. B equals uh, two alpha V, right. So that way this becomes A plus B dot Xi plus C Xi squared. And I just said that's A and B is plus two alpha V dot Xi. And this was minus alpha Xi squared. Okay, so let's complete the square. 
So this is A, and then I pull out the alpha, right? And this would be V minus psi, V is a vector, V minus psi. Let's see if I got that right. Uh, with a minus sign. So let's see if I got this right. So this gives psi squared with minus alpha. This gives v dot um, minus psi dot v minus psi dot v. There were two of those. So two and the minus sign is minus two alpha. So I have everything right, except now I have a leftover alpha v squared. So I have to take that back. And I had an A. Okay, so I rewrote this, so the F becomes exponential, so it's E, let's pull out the constant, so it's A plus alpha V squared, that came outside, and then the term with the X minus alpha V minus psi, let's put it in this way with its vector. So I've rewritten f in this uh, form, and the reason I do it is to remind you that that's precisely the Maxwellian distribution. That's not surprising that Maxwellian distribution was invented by Maxwell. <laughs> so, and he was doing exactly this problem, because Maxwell in invented the equilibrium statistical mechanics. And that's how we got the distribution here. And V denotes the velocity of the gas as a function of X and T. And so the question is, if we were thinking of X and T, this will turn out to be the velocity of the gas. Okay, so now I've told you the two pieces of information, the collisional invariance and the solution of Q of F equals zero. The first one we'll use is the collisional invariance. So let's erase here and we'll get to the using the QF equals zero in a little uh, while. Okay, now we go back to Boltzmann's equation. And the next derivation, uh, I tell a story. So my friend Constantine de Fermos, who's I think been at Keist, I, maybe only in Seoul. He didn't make it to Keist. Well, he should make it to Keist, okay. Well, so he has this very nice book on hyperbolic conservation laws and the conservation laws of continuum mechanics and the mathematical theory. And he wrote edition one, edition two, and I would see him and I'd say, you know, you really can't understand PDE, at least PDEs of mechanics, unless you understand Boltzmann. Because otherwise, the beginning student, like me, say, where did these PDEs come from? The derivations in the book, uh, mechanics books, are so complicated. Okay. Where do they come from? There must be a something basic. Okay. And of course, that's the whole point. So, I, my belief is, you don't really have a feeling for what the PDEs of mechanics are, continuum mechanics are, unless you start here. And if you start at this level, you see how simple it is. And hence the origin of why Hilbert was so intrigued. He said, oh, if it's so simple, it should be able to be proved. Okay, and that's the problem. Okay, so let's uh, start. So what do we do? Remember the collisional invariants, I won't write them down. So it's not very deep. Okay. Anybody can do it. You, me, we'll do it together. Okay, take the first Boltzmann equation. Okay, multiply by the number one. Anybody can do that. 
and integrate over R3 dx i. So not a hard computation. Now we have to give a name to these integrals. So the first thing we'll see is the integral. Let's move since we're integrating over time, the time derivative can come outside. Now, psi, x, and t, dx psi. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I, I insult your intelligence, but okay. if you've never done it before, it takes some thinking. If you've done it before, of course, it's trivial. Okay. This one, now this one is what? Now, this is d dx, but psi is an independent variable and x is an independent variable, so I can change the order of integration. And I can write this as moving the x integration outside, this becomes a divergence. Okay? d dx dot is a divergence of now we write it r3. And now the psi stays inside, uh, the, right? And the red x I took out, so it's just f. Okay. And what's the right hand side? The right hand side is zero because one was a collisional invariant. Now we could write this in a slightly different form if we start giving names. So let's give a name xixt dx, sorry, x t d psi, right? So that's a scalar, so let's, if a start is, let's give that the name capital F. Okay, and the other one that appeared in my list was Xi I F Xi XT. Okay, that's the ith component of this uh, vector. So let's give that a name, and that's Fi. So subscript I doesn't mean partial differentiation, it just means keeping track of the... Okay. So now we've seen that we've produced the equation d dt of f plus, now let's use d di to mean partial derivative with respect to the xi of fi and repeated indices means summation. So let's record that here because I'm going to And that's one equation. So we're putting the number one here. Not that it, okay. to remind it, it's just one scalar equation. Now that was so much fun, let's repeat it. Don't worry, I don't do this forever. Only two more times. <laughs> but you, as I said, if, you do, if you've never seen it, It's so, uh, so let's multiply by psi i, do the same thing, d psi, integrate. What do we have here? This is, move the ddt outside. It's psi i f. Dx i. Okay. What do we have over here? Well, again, we get a. Here we're going to get a psi i. Right. Let's write this term. It's psi i, and this is 
psi j partial with respect to j of f, right? Because it's the psi dotted with the gradient, so this is psi i, psi j, f. Okay. And d, this means dx dj. So I can move the ddj outside. And that's the psi. And what do I have on the right hand side? Remember it's psi i qf d psi equals zero, but psi i was a collisional invariance, so we get zero. Okay. What should we call this? Well, according to my notation, to be consistent, can I leave out the xi x t? It doesn't make any difference, you get the idea. So this would be f i j. So we get d d t. The first one is f i. And the next one is d d j of f i j. How many equations? Well, I equals one, two, three, so three equations. So one more time, I promised only one more time. Okay, then you'll see the whole sequence. So let's multiply by psi i, psi j. Integrate. Okay, we integrate this one. Again, we see we produce, okay, I won't. This one is d f i j, d d t f i j. What's this one? This one is, we have to write this integral. This is psi i, psi j, d d k, psi k, d d k f k. Again, move the d d k outside. Okay, so we have d d t, let's write it already here. Well, let's give that one a name. So f i j, f k, psi k, f d psi equals f i j k. Okay, so let's see, so what's the equation? Good news and the bad news. So the good news is it's nice. So it's f i j, plus d d k f i j k but now the right hand side the bad news psi I, it was psi i psi j q of f psi equals zero not zero necessarily so let's give this a name P, because P is the first letter in the word production in English. So it's a production term. We're maybe producing information at that level. So we've introduced the term P I J. Okay, how many equations? Well, it's symmetric, so six equations here. That's unfortunate. But if we take the trace, take the trace, that is set i equal to j in all arrays, then we get d d t f i i that I'm summing on i, so summing on the trace, this becomes d d k f i i k equals p i i. But what's p i i? p i i is zero because right, that's 
xi squared, and xi squared was a collisional invariant. So now we see, as I was, which is just one equation. So, how many equations do we have? We have the first equation, which is usually considered conservation of mass. The second equation, three equation, conservation of momentum. Well, momentum is a vector in three-dimensional space. So this is momentum, linear momentum. And the last guy, which is one equation, is conservation of energy. So we get five equations. So if we stop here at this level, we have five equations. So the appealing thing for me as a beginner, when I was learning continuum mechanics, okay, conservation mass, momentum, and energy, okay, it makes sense, but, but why only five? Why not ten? Okay, is the universe, but you see, that's the end of the story, or, because those are the only collisional invariants. So we're thinking, starting with the axiomization, as Hilbert was thinking, it's so appealing. You want to know where the conservation laws of mass, momentum, and energy come from? They come directly from Boltzmann without any... If you've taken course in continuum mechanics, no drawing a little box and talking about part of continua, it follows directly. I must admit, these arguments of the continua, which were due to Euler and Cauchy, are very appealing, but you don't need them. Okay, that's the good news. So the good news is uh, five equations. But how many unknowns? Well, let's count. Okay. F, Fi, Fij, which was Fii, right? And then Fii, okay. So one, this is three, this is one, and this is three. Okay. So too many unknowns. Okay. So the appealing of taking the equations and just multiplying, we have a choice. Either we have to deal with an infinite number of moments, which is impossible, Okay. Well, maybe theoretically possible, if you're a good enough mathematician. Though I warn you, no mathematician has yet been that good, but maybe you will be that good. Okay. Or we make a truncation. Okay. So we have to make some truncation, let's say stop at these five, and then we have to decide what to do about the leftover guy, and assume the leftover guy is a function of the unleftover guys. Now it's even worse than that. So we have two points. Now I had the color chalk here. Uh, let's use red, it's easier to see. So we see the pattern. So the pattern is beautiful. It goes like this. Right. This one was, uh, if I had continued, so it's always the flux of level n becomes the time derivative of level n plus 1. So it's sequential. So there's no surprises what the next, what the terms will look like. What we don't know, of course, uh, here this gets a little messy, except in the case when this last case where it happened to be a collisional invariant and I got zero. So I have two problems. So what are the two problems? Okay. that were facing the experts. One was, uh, okay, there's always going, no matter where you cut over, there's always, even here, there's going to be one leftover guy that you don't know. 
So at every truncation, one, problem number one, at every truncation, will always lead to an unknown f, call it one of the i, call it some unknown. It. So if you stopped at some level n, there'll be always one guy you, that you don't know. Okay? Too many unknowns. And the second one is once you go past uh, the first five. After five moments, we also have unknown production terms. So there's two difficulties with the moment method. Nevertheless, it's very appealing because it's changed this sort of integral differential equation into pure PDEs. And our ability as mathematicians is much better at the level of PDEs, just a fact of life. We're much better at understanding PDEs than things with this complicated expression. And what's my proof of that is because the theory of PDEs has gone so much further than the theory of the Boltzmann equation. So it's in a, in a, just a fact of life. So what's the, the plan? Okay. Okay. So I'll continue next one. Okay. So the plan is, first of all, okay, okay, how do we do truncation? So let's say just a few words, five minutes. So how do we do truncation? And do we believe truncation is a good idea? So, so, so do we believe so truncation? So, why do truncation? Well, I say it's uh, logic. If I could do something better than truncation, I would do it. But it's my uh, feeling, okay, let's do truncations and try to understand truncations. And from the truncation, let's study the PDEs. And from those PDEs of the truncation, let's see if we can answer Hilbert's question, at least at the truncation. And the reason is as follows. If the truncation, it's logic, common sense, I think. If the truncation worked and we could resolve Hilbert's problem positively, and we could go from Boltzmann, at least the truncations, to the Euler, we would say, oh, it stands a chance. Okay. Things didn't go bad. But on the other hand, if the truncations fail, the truncation problem, which is easier, fails to go from Boltzmann to Euler, which I think it does, then we'd say, look, if it doesn't work in the easy case, do you really expect that it's going to work in the hard case? It's just common sense. It's not proof, but it's just common sense to me. When you do test cases, let's say, you're trying uh, anything you want, okay. You're checking to see if you can add two odd numbers. Will it always give an odd number? Oh, I don't know, it's a hard problem. Let me try. One plus one, two. No, it's an even number. Okay, it failed. Okay, so no sense trying to make a general theorem. I have counterexample. So let's try something really simple. And that, so, so we'll do truncations. Okay, so what's the idea of the truncation? Okay. Well, the first truncation, of course, ideas, and I'll go through that. The first truncation will, is the simplest, okay, and that'll deliver the Euler equation, so I'll do that next time. The next truncation, the idea of using truncations beyond the simplest was due comparatively recently, recently being 1949. Okay, I don't know if that's recent to you. I was five years old, so recent to me. Okay, by Harold Grad at Courant. Of course, it wasn't called Courant, then it was just called NYU uh, Math Department. It was 
Institute for Mathematics, or whatever they called it then. So Harold Grad did it in 1949. It was a paper which was rather fundamental. And why did he do it? Okay. And the answer, on, for better or for worse, okay, my uh, historical understanding, people were studying the Boltzmann equation after World War II very seriously. Why? Because if you understand how an atomic bomb works, nuclear reactor, and unfortunately, or fortunate, unfortunate probably, the essence of how the hydrogen bomb worked, or works, okay, it's all based on understanding things at very small scale. So people wanted to find ways to solve the Boltzmann equation. And computers weren't com comparatively not well developed then, so they're looking for methods to solve the Boltzmann equation as PDEs, exactly like this. So strongly motivated by n nuclear weapons, but that's sad fact, but true. Okay, so that was Harold Grad. And then the ideas were developed further. It was continued. Grad's ideas were developed by Ingo Muller, who had a whole group working with him in Germany, and before that at Johns Hopkins. And Muller wrote many papers in, starting in the 1960s, and he has his book, which I recommend, Springer Book. Muller and Ruggeri, which I also have here. And they put the whole program of doing the moments into a comprehensive theory, and many people have worked on it since. So to finish up today, why do moments? Because it's a cheap way, in some sense, to solve the Boltzmann equation, and hence the engineers, physicists, or nuclear engineers, made sense. If I can find the cheap way to solve the Boltzmann equation, that's wonderful because to do the computation numerically is terrible. People have to do it, but it's quite terrible. Okay, then it says a quarter to twelve, so I'll continue with truncation on Thursday. Okay, any questions? No, don't applaud, it's not just that. Uh, any questions though? Yeah. So in the definition of collision invariance, yeah. you want to Make, find the, the conservation of mass and the linear momentum and energy, right? Yeah. Then why don't you consider the angular momentum? Oh, because it's, it comes from the symmetry. Angular momentum is automatic. It, it, it says that the Cauchy stress tensor has to be symmetric. And the Cauchy stress tensor that we derive this way is automatically symmetric. So the symmetry is built into the Boltzmann. Okay. Angular momentum is is equivalent to the symmetry of the Cauchy stress tensor, Tij equals Tji. Okay, and that comes automatically from the Boltzmann. You can think why, because Boltzmann is a purely isotropic theory. Yeah. Okay, so Navier-Stokes equation, okay, Okay, and the, the program of Hilbert for the Navier-Stokes equation does work, but it's a different scaling. Okay, so Navier-Stokes is incompressible gas dynamics, okay, like more or less water. Okay, sort of compressible, but we model as incompressible. Okay, so Navier-Stokes equation is incompressible. Even the Euler equation, okay, you can make an incompressible Euler equation. Okay. So what happens in uh, such cases, okay, Navier-Stokes, because this Navier-Stokes, for example, no shock waves. Okay. If you have, it's incompressible, incompressibility rules out the possibility of shock waves. If the possibility of shock waves is ruled out, then Hilbert's program will go through. So the lady, uh, Los Saint Ramon, but proceeding, so she did incompressible, incompressible case works out, so it's incompressible Euler in, its, uh, in her book, but proceeding that, there was her thesis advisor, Gols, by those Levermore, and they had gone from Boltzmann 
do, can I write incompressible Navier Stokes? So the program does go through. So they were quite optimistic. So if I can answer your question even further, this is a good question, it says, it, which says, that what is that telling us, if anything? What's the whole problem here? Okay, shock, no shock waves there, but shock waves in the gas. So it must be that if there's something going wrong, it must be because of the shock wave. And my conclusion is exactly. Okay. And uh, to advertise, they will never do it. Now, these guys, of course, and this lady, are very smart, smarter than I am, of course. It's a program, so in Paris, people will continue to work on it. But I say, okay, they will fail. So, that is the answer? Yeah. How can you know FI to be called FI? FI, this one? This, yeah, this is an unknown. We don't know it. So you have a, ch that's why it's unknown. That's the definition of unknown. I don't know what it is. It's, 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 to get a DDT of FI, I kind of have to go here. Follow the red lines. Where was the red chalk? I don't know. So this one won't occur till over there, but then it'll just introduce. Okay. You're always trying to juggle, and you always have one ball left over. So the, you, the engineer, the physicist, the mathematician, have to decide what to do. If you want to get a finite system from the infinite, you have to close the system. If I, this one. This one? Yeah, this one. So to know what it is, I have to, it's evolution is determined here, but then I don't know this one. But even in the, to get the FIJ, but I can, why only, th oh, how do I get FIJ? I can get FIJ from these ones and the others. It's possible, so, okay. If I closed it here, I would close it such precisely that there are five, so. You can get everything. I'll do it next time. That's how you get the Euler equations. Yeah. Excuse me, I cannot uh, recognize uh, after five months we also have here. After five, uh, after five moments, we also have, oh, if you go beyond five, then because there's no more collisional invariance, you'll always have terms PIJ, PIJK, PIJK, all the letters of the alphabet, okay, you'll, you'll run, you'll always have these production terms because there are no more collisional invariants. So not only do you have the problem of the extra Fs, you have the problem of the extra Ps after five. So there's an extra difficulty. But at the level of five, which is still not for free, you still have to make some decision. But that's what Euler decided to do. Any other questions? Okay, then see you on Thursday if you want to come. If you don't want to come, that's okay too. <laughs>